So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today's talk is part of our Sunday Forum series. I'm Pim Baxter. I'm one of the lay canons here at the Cathedral, and I'm doubly delighted to be chairing this event, not only because I greatly admire Canon Tricia and looking forward to what she's going to say, but also because Canon Tricia and I were both installed on the same day at the same service in March 2014. So we've both, we were both new girls together and we've kind of learnt things together as we've gone along. So um, I, I feel a great affinity with Canon and Tricia. Um, so before we begin, just to set the scene, uh, Tricia Hillis is the Canon pastor here at St Paul's Cathedral. She oversees the welfare and training of all the people at St Paul's. She leads the pastoral mission, as well as developing relationships and chaplaincy style support for our regular worshippers and for people of Christian faith across London. Before becoming canon pastor, Tricia was vicar of St Barnabas in Northwood. She was born in Kuala Lumpur and she trained as a social worker before her ordination in 2002. Tricia's experience of engaging with a wide variety of disadvantages as a social worker in London, and in particular working with people with HIV or AIDS, as well as her parish experience, means that she's very experienced in guiding people through their liminal moments. So, Tricia will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for questions and obviously answers, and we'll finish promptly at about 2 p.m. So, will you all join me in welcoming Tricia. Thank you so much. Some of us were upstairs uh, a few moments ago and one of our hymns concluded with this verse. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I'll walk till travelling days are done. Now, if you're sitting comfortably, the wood between the worlds. For a moment, everything became muddled. The next thing Diggory knew was that there was a soft green light coming down on him from above and a darkness below. He didn't seem to be standing on anything or sitting or lying. I believe I'm in water, said Diggory, or underwater. Then his head suddenly came out into the air and he found himself scrambling ashore out onto a smooth grassy ground at the edge of a pool. As he rose to his feet, he noticed that he was neither dripping nor panting for breath, as anyone would expect after being underwater. He was standing by the edge of a small pool in a wood. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that he could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was green light that came through the leaves. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others as far as the eye could see. You could almost feel the trees drinking up the water with their roots. This wood was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterwards, Diggory always said, it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. From The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. It was interesting to note nods of recognition from some of you at least. In this excerpt, one of the children in C.S. Lewis's Narnian tale finds himself in this remarkable space. In fact, a space between spaces, a place between places, a wood, as we heard, filled with trees and pools. And Diggory discovers that each pool of water is actually the entry point to a different world. 
But all those worlds are held together by this one space, the wood between the worlds. And I hope that beginning with this image of this place that's as rich as plum cake might set us thinking about the richness and the mystery that's to be found in the places that are betwixt and between, the in-between times of life and of faith. I wanted to begin, though, by saying it's always a great pleasure to be part of the Adult Learning Institute event, learning events and to say a huge thanks to, in their absence, so amongst ourselves, but we hope they hear it, to Jen Powell, who greeted you today, and to Elizabeth Foy, <clears throat> as together they bring together this amazing programme. Today, it's my privilege to speak and share on the subject of the gate of heaven, God at the crossing place. We're going to be thinking about the significance of the crossing points in all of our lives. Those moments which might be great and really dramatic, and those things which might also be small and almost insignificant. And yet they're thresholds in our lives that take us between one aspect of life and another. I hope to touch on three areas. Why and how these crossing places and times are so rich in meaning. We'll be spending most of our time on that. How we can hold our nerve as we cross through them. And what it means to be the people of God, the people of the crossing. To begin, I'd like to suggest then that there is something precious in these moments. In these times that are between, they're neither one thing nor another. They're sort of that on the way to becoming something. These threshold times, and you'll hear me say that word over and over, that make them rich with possibility. I'm going to say that although they can be disturbing and unsettling to pass through, they're really significant because they enable us to cross to our truest selves. They teach us something about who we are. They then prompt us, I hope, to step across the borders of ourselves towards others and they're times that connect us with one another. And then most important of all, that they are the moments in our lives that encourage us to embrace the encounter with the God who steps towards us and who crosses to meet us and who, as in Psalm 23, leads us through the crossing place. So are you ready for the adventure? We begin again by thinking about what we mean by liminal times and places. Andrew, my husband, is here and I was just talking with Pim a moment ago about the fact we've just booked a holiday to a Greek island. We're really privileged to have travelled through many Greek islands and we love them. But once we were travelling on the island of Kefalonia and when we were there we were shown ruins of houses They'd been destroyed on the 12th of August, 1953, when an earthquake struck the whole of that region. There was something quite remarkable about those houses, I felt. When you looked at the remains, the stones that made up the walls were scattered hither and thither across the the hillsides. But when you got closer, Many a time, the long stones which made up the door jams and the lintel were still in their original positions, bereft of walls. And our guide who was with us told us about how he had been a boy during that earthquake and he remembered sheltering in just one of those doorways. He said that during that earthquake, the safest place to be was there in the doorway. Now, I've checked this out a bit, because I'm always a bit suspicious. Um, It's probably not so true of modern buildings, but in a building like this one and like those, that guide was saying that what, what it was to be in that door place was to be in the safest place of all. And I think that's really fascinating. 
not to have been in one room or another, but in the space in between. Is that not extraordinary? Physical doorways are an example then of tangible crossing places, but we know, and that's the heart of what we're sharing together, that there are other times just as significant, not physical, but just as relevant as crossing places for us. You probably are aware that anthropologists give them the term liminal. It comes from a Latin word limin, which means literally threshold, which is why I've been going on and on about it. Can I take you to an everyday example here at the cathedral? We celebrate Evensong every day, and some of you will be regulars at that, you'll know. And I love it for all kinds of reasons, uh, for the fact that people come from all over the world to be here, for the amazing choral music that we're able to just be blessed by, for the rhythm of prayer and bringing the world into God's presence in a very particular way. But I also love it because of the particular time of day that we gather. And when I'm given the privilege of, of leading or welcoming, I often begin with something like this. Welcome to this service of Evensong. As day turns to evening, Christians have traditionally paused to review the day, to offer praise and to pray, and for good reason. Like pilgrims after one day's journey, we pause to rest and to be replenished in God's presence. As we bring our prayer, our worship and praise, may you find space to be still and at peace. And through the readings, prayers, silence and music, may God meet you afresh. And as you leave, may you go with a renewed vision of God's glory and love. Something about evening tide, the twilight, the coming of evening being this fulcrum moment and our prayer that we enter but leave differently a liminal moment it's like the turning of a page from one chapter to another our lives are riven with these sorts of moments and times of transition some of them are huge some of them take place on a micro level and i think that at whatever level they take place there are opportunities, opportunities to, as I said, understand more of ourselves, of others, and to connect again with God. There is a sense in which we're in transition all the time. We never know quite what the next moment will bring, do we? Each breath is a, a bridge, really, between life and death. But most of the time, we don't feel like we're liminal people. We feel like what happens now is just going to be what happens tomorrow, and we'll just carry on as we are. And yet, from time to time, we're, born, we're brought face to face with the most life-changing of thresholds. Sometimes they're predictable. Sometimes they come completely out of the blue transitions and crossing points like giving birth, starting school or study, becoming a teenager, moving home, beginning or ending a relationship, being diagnosed with a particular medical condition. For a moment, can I ask you to just pause with me and to turn to a neighbour and to just consider what other liminal life changes you are aware of that we, you, others, any of us might experience. Could you please do that for just a moment? It's true, isn't it? There's lots to say. We were talking about getting married, uh, two cultures, family cultures coming together, leaving one country for another, becoming a grandparent, getting divorced, finding a new job, or being someone who has suddenly forced upon us all by choice, being asked to find a new direction in life. Now, we cross these thresholds in life from one way of being to another 
throughout our lives. And each time we do, we're face to face with questions. Questions about ourselves, which reveal something of who we have been, who we are now, and whom we might be becoming. We're asked questions about others and how we relate to them. And we're asked questions about God. The transitions that you might have been talking about that we've been referring to are often defined by being times that include waiting and of not knowing. You heard how I've in the past worked very closely with people who were diagnosed with HIV and was part of the team that would be um, briefing them before counselling them and then working with them after the diagnosis. And for many of them in the early days, they would speak about that sense of being totally disorientated because you didn't know where you would be, what would happen. Thankfully, that is so much different now. But it's that vulnerability. There may be certainty for us in the place we are. We may hope for certainty in the place we're heading to. But actually, in that crossing place, we've often got little choice but to entrust ourselves and to hand over control. If you're a control freak like me, that's terrible. Flying is terrible, not because I'm terrified, but I just don't like not being in control. But I think those sorts of crossing places are just the sorts of spaces that the Holy Spirit can then get in. I want to take us to one biblical story, one of our forefathers in the faith, one of the Jewish patriarchs, and his experience of being in the crossing place. Let me read to you, if I may, from Genesis chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down. And he dreamt that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob is in a desert place. Beautifully, for the point of this talk, we don't exactly know where. It was somewhere between Beersheba and Haran, a sort of in-between, unknown sort of place. And there, in that liminal, lim liminal moment between wakefulness and sleep, Jacob dreams. And in his dream, he encounters God between heaven and earth. Jacob's family life was, you could say, complex. He was a young man who was running away. He and his twin brother had both wanted their father's dying blessing. Jacob's mother helped him trick both his father and his brother. Esau, his brother, was furious. Jacob was terrified and he fled. It was a major transition point in Jacob's life. He'd left home and he was out and on his way and who knows where. But that night proved to be a crossing point. He'd never have been able to anticipate it, but by the time the dawn came, Jacob would never ever be the same 
again. He dreamt then of this ladder between earth and heaven, its top reaching heaven, its lower rungs on earth, angels descending and ascending upon it, coming and going. And then God, right there in that place of crossing. And there God says to Jacob, I am the Lord your God, father of your father Abraham and God of Isaac. And he makes promises to him which were just astounding. Promises of an astounding destiny, but also promises of God's presence always. Know that I am with you and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob wakes and finds himself in that ordinary place again, in between sort of place, the same rocks, the same sand. You could maybe say the same hospital waiting room, the same church with all its difficulties, the same task lists of things to be done, the same unresolved family dilemmas. And yet, Jacob says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. It is the gate of heaven. He, in that place, woke up. He woke up to God, and so he marked the place, setting the stone that had been his pillow up as an altar. Jacob's family had imploded. He was a downright scoundrel and a trickster. He was on the run, and yet God chose to meet with him in the crossing place. I'd like to suggest that for Jacob and for us, liminal moments, the crossing places in life, teach us much because of several things. First of all, that crossing points, because they are times between times, a woman, a young girl becoming a woman, a man becoming a husband, they prompt us to gather ourselves and to reflect on what's truly important. They invite us to pause. We heard in C.S. Lewis that that wood between the worlds was a quiet place. They can invite us to quieten ourselves and to make choices. As parish priests and here at the cathedral, we often see parents bringing both themselves and their children to church for the very first time as they become parents. There's something about that life change which for many people prompts questions about what they themselves want for their children and their families. Moments of transition invite us sometimes to just ask that question, what am I here for? What am I living for? Crossing places are also times when we are prompted to consider what we carry with us. You know, if you're going through a doorway and Jesus said something to this effect, you can only take so much with you. You can only fit so much through. And if you've moved home or you know anyone who has, you also know that when you're decluttering in order to pack, you have to make real choices about what you take with you to your next phase of life. That Watford rug, do I still want that? Is that really me? Who am I and who am I becoming? It can provoke some deep soul searching and it's not just about things. As I move from this phase of life to the next, do I really need to carry this emotional, this spiritual state with me? What do I need to just leave behind? And crossing points also, as we've hinted at, invite us to consider our own identities, especially through the lens of our vulnerabilities, connected with that sense of uncertainty in the crossing. Two years ago, a friend underwent medical test after medical test. It could never quite be established what was on the move, what was happening for him. 
Eventually word came that he was living with multiple sclerosis and he would say and said at the time that it had been the time of uncertainty of waiting for the answers that were by far the hardest, harder even than the actual confirmation of the diagnosis. And waiting, thresholds, not knowing what is next, are everywhere in life. Each ushers in a new chapter and each provokes disruption. Whether it's something joyful, like getting married, or a new job, or a new home, or a new city, whether it's something more challenging, like divorce, or sickness, or changing friendships, they can be disorientating until our equilibrium is found again. And Franciscan friar Richard Rohr says this about such places and times. He describes them as a unique spiritual position where human beings hate to be, but where the biblical God is always leaving them. It is when you have left the tried and true, but have not yet been able to replace it with anything else. It's when you are finally out of the way. It's when you are between your old comfort zone and any possible new answer. And this is the key bit. If you're not trained in how to hold anxiety, how to live with ambiguity, how to entrust and wait, you will run anything to flee this terrible cloud of unknowing. The crossing place and the crossing places in life can be uncomfortable places to be. As I've said, not least because I have to just give up control for a moment. The crossing place is not a destination that I can say, hurrah, I've arrived, or it's another thing I can tick off and say, I have done. It's the place that I'm reminded that I'm a guest and I'm just passing through. But because of that very, very thing, I think it's also the place of liberation, of being able to dare and to adventure, and a place to encounter God on very different terms than usual, maybe God to, God's terms rather than ours. As you came in, you'll have found on your seat an image or two related to the concept of crossings. Can I ask you, uh, you may be sitting on it and you might have to shuffle to, to dig it out. Uh, dig your own uh, image out, I would say, not someone else's. Um, could you take hold of it and again turn to someone near you and ponder for a minute the question, in what way might this image speak to something I've just heard or thought about in relation to these liminal moments in our lives? In what way might this image speak to what I've just heard about or thought about in relation to liminal or crossing moments in life? Please. I think that at the heart of many of the thresholds that we've been starting to think about today is a central truth that we are fragile and gloriously temporal human creatures. That we live our whole lives in the betwixt and between. If you know Bede's sparrow and that idea of a sparrow swooping through a great hall and for a moment being in this wonderful place of light and warmth, that we're fragile and temporal and yet we're destined for eternity. We live in the crossing. The priest poet John O'Donoghue captures something of this life in the crossing. It's in the introduction to his book, which is called Divine Beauty. And he says this, we live between the act of awakening and the act of surrender. Each morning we awaken to the light and the invitation to a new day in the world of time. Each night, we surrender to the dark, to be taken to play in the world of dreams where time is no more. 
At birth, we were awakened and emerged to become visible in the world. At death, we will surrender again to the dark. Awakening and surrender, they frame each day and each life. Between them, the journey where anything can happen. Ooh, that, <laughs> the journey where anything can happen. Does that not make your spine tingle? It is glorious. I accept though that change can be terrifying in our own lives, but also we live in interesting times in change and uncertainty. And so much that's changing in our public shared lives can also feel really unsettling and a little terrifying. The ancient people of God, the first Christians, our mothers and fathers in the faith in more recent centuries have all known though and lived through periods of major change. So let us take hope because the present time is a period of change for the Christian church in the West. It really is. The old understanding of Christendom is breaking down. Some would argue, and no bad thing. It is being replaced by a new way of being church and of living out our faith, which is only really just starting to emerge and coming into focus. And it can be greatly discomforting especially for those of us who are used to being in very strongly institutionalized places. Yet I believe that we can take courage in this crossing and in these times of change. So quickly, how might we do what Richard Rohr invited us to do, to hold anxiety, to live with the ambiguity, to entrust and to wait as the hopeful and liminal people of God in a world that is changing and in our own lives. Quickly, let's not be fearful of the fact that we may fear fear, feel fear. Does that make sense? Um, my brother's favorite uh, story when he was a child, which meant that his older sister had to tell it to him over and over again, was the three Billy Groats gruff. It's a Norwegian folk tale, and it involves three goats, one bridge, and a troll. Um, and in this story, there is a crossing, a bridge, over a stream under which lives this very dangerous troll who would emerge and threaten anyone who was trying to cross with the threat of being gobbled up. Eventually, the last and the biggest of the goats takes on the troll, charges face on, the troll falls into the stream and is carried off in the most polite of the stories. From then on, the crossing is clear, and so anyone who wants to cross can cross. I tell this to say, do you know, sometimes it just is terrifying. Making the transition, sometimes crossing is hard. And sometimes fears just are there to be faced. So take courage, it's the moral that it's the heart of all and so many of our human folk tales. Don't be afraid or face the fear if there is fear to be faced. And often, as the folk tales remind us, we don't face them alone. So let's not be fear fearful of the fact that we may feel fear. Living in ambu and, uh, ambiguity often calls also for rightful lament. You know the psalm writers with their psalms that cry out, how long, how long, why, O oh Lord, O oh why? And I think sometimes you just have to, while facing the fear, sing in the crossing. And sometimes those songs will be songs that someone will have to sing with you. Uh, and someone will need to lift their voice beside you. And sometimes those songs will be sung in the minor key. There'll be songs of pain and distress, even of despair. But they're songs that are true, and they connect us with the one who was acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows. 
And therefore, those kinds of songs sung in crossing times when all uncertainty is around us, I think are wonderfully subversive and dangerous because they acknowledge how life is. And they remind us, though, that the last word has not yet been said or sung or spoken for us or for the world. And you know that music of the African-American spiritual. It was born out of oppression and out of slavery. It wasn't comfortable words or songs of the status quo. They're powerful laments of the crossing. And they've been described as piercing to the deepest anguish and hope of the heart. And I'm particularly reminded of them now because a bust of Paul Robeson is upstairs on our cathedral floor. It's there to commemorate that he was here 60 years ago last month. He was here to raise funds for the defence of the South African treason trials. 156 people in South Africa, including Nelson Mandela, were accused of treason. The service here to raise money for their defence was attended by around 4,000 people. Many had to stand at the back. There were people outside the cathedral because they couldn't get in. And yet, the coming of change in South Africa would be a very long crossing. But it did come. Sometimes to be people of God in the crossing is to those who will in the crossing sing. Even if those are songs of lament, they're also songs of freedom and hope. We're not being fearful of the fact that we may need to feel fear. We're learning that lamenting is sometimes the right response for we refuse to be silenced. We're ready to be changed. All the human rights of passage underscore this that you don't negotiate any crossing and emerge anything but different. A boy becomes a man. Two people decide that they can no longer live together. We're not simply what we were before. They shape us, these transitions. Like Jacob, we might be given a new name, and he was out of that experience a new purpose, a new promise. But we might also, like Jacob, look back, maybe a long time afterwards, and say, surely God was somewhere in that place. And I think, as I've said before, that we who temporarily dwell in the crossing are those who need to recognise that transition is the way of all life, right up to eternity. This glorious cathedral, one of our former colleagues, Mark, used to say, it's not a bad office, and we used to giggle. But this place has a history of being a place of crossing. I don't know if you're aware of it. Um, I was talking with our archivists um, in preparation for this talk that the medieval cathedral had an element to it which was called St Paul's Walk, um, the Wren, even the Wren's building, uh, this wonderful one, uh, was at the beginning a, a thoroughfare and a meeting place. And our huge nave was a place of unruly concourse. Isn't that lovely? I'd like a bit more unruly concourse from time to time. But these cathedral buildings have been literal crossing places. And today, if you ever come, and I know some of you do, through our West End doors, you'll see that statement etched onto the glass. This is the gate of heaven. And our prayer that the Spirit might invoke in us that longing to encounter God. But as a whole, the church exists in an in-between time. We're an in-between people, a provisional community always. This glorious building itself is only one of many on this site since 604. And every time we gather, as we do here and upstairs, we are provisional congregation, and that's the joy, because each time there will be those of us who are rooted here and those from around the world. But together we're looking for the coming kingdom and its king. We just are a transitional community 
We are a threshold community. We are called to be those who are open to a future that's still yet unknown and yet confident that the future belongs to God. We just live in the community that is the crossing point of time and eternity. We began with part of the first chronicle of Narnia. I close now, just before questions, with some words. In fact, they are the closing words of the very last of the Narnian chronicles, the last battle. So having been urged to come further up and further in, Aslan, who's the lion at the heart of all the stories, breathes on the children and says this. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And the narrator says, for us, this is the end of all the stories, but for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and which, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia. That was such food for thought there. And I um, don't know about everyone in the room, but just amazing images, starting from the sort of idea of being in the doorway and knowing whether you know which way you're going to go and the other thing I really took from it was the, the sort of unpacking of, of um, anxiety and, and learning how to manage it because I think with a, a lot of us quite often the small liminal moments come when we've also got big ones and we, we, we kind of they all start to come together so I think I don't think I'll think about those kind of decision times about remembering that th these are sort of liminal moments. So time for questions. I hope you've got um, some questions, Patricia. I thought I'd just start by myself asking, is there, is there a very big liminal moment in your, in your life where you really realised you were on that threshold and you were going to step? Thank you. So the question about whether there's been a very big liminal moment in my life when I realised I was going to have to choose about stepping through. Gosh, I think if I'm honest, I tend to find I, that I arrive at liminal moments and then have to decide what to do at that point. So I'm never someone who's had a life plan. Um, so, so I'm constantly surprised by liminal moments, big and small. But an example would be arriving here. Um, and we were just laughing, saying we both were installed on the same day and it will be five years next year. Maybe we should get a tattoo. Um, <laughs> just to shock all our colleagues. We'll probably work on a fake tattoo, but don't keep that secret. Don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. Um, so, because that was just so unlikely, really unlikely. And... Um, what I needed to do in that time when it, it became a possibility was to spend time. I actually went to Santiago Cathedral and spent time in silence. I laughed a lot because it seemed so absurd um, and spoke with others. Um, and so, yes, and, and you just never know when life will then next lead, do you, at all? Thank you, example. So, question. Yeah, I think that's such a brilliant question. Thank you, because it's a very deep question about if you're not having so many major life changes, where does that leave you in place in relation to God and does that mean you're a failure? I think two things strike me. Um, we've been talking a lot about change. There could be a twin talk by someone far more erudite on stability. 
which is a great, a great monastic thread, isn't it? Stabilitas, uh, a core of a core of Benedictine uh, spirituality. And I think that sense of longing for rootedness, which many of us have, if we are blessed with it in some way, I would see it as a blessing. And there are different spiritual lessons to be learned in the place of stability. So if life is stable, thanks be to God. And I think there are different lessons to be learned. The other thing is something that, that Pim and I were talking about, is that I think it's uh, probably easiest to think of this in terms of the big life changes but actually through the day there are these liminal points um, and uh, we, were say, we were saying that um, Celtic Christians uh, particularly in Britain I'm not sure about elsewhere picked up on the thread of changes that happen during the day so hence monastic life has the rhythm of prayer that marks those small liminal changes from day to night. Um, Celtic Christians would have prayers and, and they're there, especially in the Irish tradition, around uh, prayers on, on waking, prayers on dressing, prayers on beginning work, prayers on the day's work end. Um, and one of my patterns has been about having little punctuating prayers as I begin a new bit of work or a new, you know, a new part of the day. So I think you, we uh, can be open to big transitions, but also little ones. So I hope, I hope that speaks a bit to that. So I don't see that as failure. I think I see it as different. Thank you. So the, your question being about how do we deal with, with life when we're surrounded by people who may be more pessimistic and might predict, make all kinds of predictions about how things are changing, but only ever for the worst. Um, well, funnily enough, I was doing a bit of sewing yesterday, and when I sew, this is a flippant answer, forgive this, and then I'll come to the real answer. Um, when I sew, I like to have the, the radio on or something, and so I was listening to BBC iPlayer radio and found um, currently they've got a, a Radio 4 programme on um, the Mayan calendar. And do you remember how the end of the world was supposed to take place on the 21st of December 2012? And I just thought, oh, this will cheer me up because, you know, <laughs> I'll listen to it so many years on. And actually, it didn't happen. Hurrah. Um, so, so, so I think, so sometimes actually it's with humour. It's how I cope. You can tell that I'm bitter and slightly twisted. Um, but I also think, I think that is the deep calling, actually, of the church. Um, and others, actually. If I can be very honest, ooh, and I'm aware this is being recorded, um, the other day there was outside the Old Bailey, very near to us, there was a, a group of people who were gathering because Tommy Robinson was being um, in front of the court there. And I thought, because I'm you know, interested in how we all tick, how do we tick? I thought, actually, I'm going to go down, not because I went out without my dog collar, actually, um, um, for various reasons. Partly because I thought if I'm arrested, then the dean can pretend he doesn't know who I, <laughs> who I am. Um, but I was really, you know, and it made me quite depressed, I have to say. And, and funnily enough, one of my friends who isn't a Christian just sort of was pointing out, actually, there are people of good faith you know, there are people of goodwill, don't forget, and actually let it spur you to more goodwill. And I thought, oh, I'm supposed to be witnessing to you because, you know, I'm a priest and you're not even a Christian yet. And, you know, but he has such wisdom. And, um, and I think there is something about that. And I think it's something about looking for the hope and being the hope. I'm trying not to be too yucky, but, you know, you know I think just do it is what I took from my friend. Just pull yourself together, Tricia. So the question from our friend is, when we're in a liminal moment for a long period of time and uh, watching, waiting, trying to evaluate and decide, as well as waiting for outside things to happen, I guess, oh, any advice? Um, I think, the thing that springs to mind, which, you know, I offer it, it may not be right for your situation, 
um, is that, uh, funnily enough, Andrew and I were, it sounds very uh, funny to say, but we were trying to climb a mount, uh, a volcano in um, South America called Cotopaxi. And, um, and as you can tell, um, you know, I'm a plodder, I, a hiker, you know, I have one foot in front of the other, and this was a bit scary because uh, it involved um, axes and ropes and crampons and things, not my kind of thing really. Um, and we were with a group of people, some of whom were proper, what I call proper mountaineers, you know, and I looked at one of the women and I was talking to her and saying, how do you, because you know, I grew up in Lincolnshire, we don't, <laughs> we don't have hills. So I'm terrified all the time when I'm walking. I, you know, if, we, if there's a precipice, I will do it, but I hate it. And that's partly where I'm talking about the, you know, kind of feel the fear, face it, just do it, Tricia, because, you know. Um, and, and I looked at her and I, and I said to her, how do you do it? Because you go gambling along like this wonderful mountain goat. And how do you do that? And she said, oh, actually, I'm terrified too. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, no, you're lying. And she said, no, she said, I said, well, what do you do? And she said, well, actually, <clears throat> for her, it was a case, she said, I just look for the next rock. And I kind of say, do you know, I may not get to the top of the mountain, but I'm going to that rock. And I said, really, does that work? Um, and she said, yeah, try it, try it, try it. And there was something in that, that, that even though it was this long, 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 terrifying track, it was, it was thinking, I just need, I'm just going to go there, that's all. Once I've done that, I may turn back, you know, my little reassurance, I may turn back, um, but I'm going there. So, and, and that can be hard though, because I hear nine years and I think, how do you, how do you hold on for nine years? Um, and, and so I'm not sure I have all the wisdom, but I think some of those things around fear, lamenting, asking the challenging questions of God and oneself, um, maybe looking for the next rock and just entrusting um, and I hope being part of that community that's because you know I wonder how did Nelson Mandela and, and uh, John Collins here who worked so hard for them <laughs> with that terrifying terrible terrible outcome to that trial how did they sustain hope and yet they did and actually that's that's one of the things I think I'm curious about how people do that. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. Sadly, I'm going to have to draw this to a close. Um, can I just thank on all our behalfs, Cal and Tricia, that was just fantastic. Really, really gave us much to think about. So thank you. And can I thank you all for being with us today? It's lovely to have such a, a great audience. Um, I just need to remind you that the next Sunday Forum will be on the 2nd of December with Stephen Cottrell and he's going to reflect on the profound questions around prayer and why so often we find it to be a struggle. I also need to remind you that um, there's a form and if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to be added to it, please do fill in the form. Um, and hand it to Jen, I think, as, as you leave. And if you're not sure whether you are or not, then just, just complete it anyway and we'll, we'll sort it out. And then there are also copies here of the current leaflet. So if you haven't already got one of these, do please take one um, and it will tell, tell you, what, you know, what's coming up next. Or if you've already got one yourself, take one for a friend. And um, I hope very much that you'll come back and join us again. And I'll just finish by saying thank you again very much. Thank you.